this week's programme, we're going to be talking to Ruth Dyson. We're also going to be talking to the MPI guys. Peter Hyde will be telling us what's been happening as far as they're concerned. And also Jim Grierson is back from a journey out of New Zealand. Just a moment, though, is Animal Health Prevention and Cure. Nick, lambing losses? Yeah, time to talk about that. Anyone who's been around the countryside can see what's been happening lately with the little white little things bouncy bouncing white around. Things bouncing exactly. around. Um, so yes, I guess it's uh, lamb losses is an important aspect to uh, livestock farming when we're talking about um, lamb production. And I guess in order to look into problems as they occur, um, we rely exceptionally a lot on farmers recording really. Um, and so the importance of recording the number of dry drives and wet drives, and I'll, I'll go into the definition of that in just a second, um, is, is very, very important, particularly when it's uh, compared to, to prior scanning data if that's available. And so when we talk about dry drives, we talk about ewes that fail to produce a lamb uh, and they fail to come into milk. And the implication there is that perhaps there's been some very early loss of an embryo or mm -hmm. perhaps there's been a problem with the with the ewe not getting in lamb at all. Uh, that's where scanning comes in obviously and that's where we can determine these problems. Wet dries um, on the other hand are obviously uh, by inference uh, ewes that fail to produce a lamb or fail to be seen with a lamb um, but they're producing milk so the inference there is that perhaps we've had a very uh, late stage abortion or a lamb that's been lost once on the ground. Um, so obviously it doesn't take a, a genius to sort of understand that the causes for either one of those those issues can be, can be very, very different and range from uh, a lot of management issues, particularly when we're talking about wet dries, um, compared to a number of uh, primarily animal health issues when we're talking about embryonic loss. And of course at this stage, with the conditions we're experiencing, it's a case of if it's dry, get rid of it. Yeah, absolutely. If there's, if there's inference that that ewe is not going to uh, be of value in the future, um, as far as any future production goes, well then, of course, when we're trying to conserve uh, resources for, for productive units on a farm, you know, we need to, we need to all the assistance we can get in making a call on which, which heads of stock to quit and, mm. and which to, to run through. That brings me through to nutrition and uh, starvation. Absolutely. So um, when we talk about <coughs> uh, early lamb losses particularly, so we've got uh, wet dry ewes by inference as I just said, early lamb losses primarily can be caused through one of two issues. We, we call it uh, starvation or hypothermia. And then the difference, working at the difference between each one is quite important because when we talk about uh, starvation of lambs, um, we, we've got a number of, of potential problems that we might be looking at. Um, and I guess some of the more seasoned of us watching would understand when I mentioned the word white muscle disease, mm -hmm. um, selenium deficiency, sometimes uh, caused through vitamin E deficiency, less, less common in New Zealand however. Uh, causing a problem with the skeletal muscle uh, function of the newborn lamb and, and these lambs just fail to be able to stand up to drink and so th they die pretty quickly. Um, so actually quick post-mortem examination of these dead lambs can yield a lot of information even from the farmer themselves. Is there milk within the stomach? If so, of course the lamb has stood to drink. Uh, if there is and the lamb has still died, then perhaps we're talking about uh, managerial factors as far as inclement weather, less commonly disease in the first few days of life, uh, as long as as long as they've they've, they've had a drink. So um, and of course, looking at the lungs, are they pink? Have has that lamb actually drawn a breath? Um, if the lamb hasn't drawn a breath, perhaps it's a late stage abortion or a, a, a lamb that's died in utero. So with the lungs, how does it, it changes to pink when they have? When they have, so if a lamb has drawn breath, they turn a nice little salmony pink colour. If there's been no breath drawn into the lungs, they look just like liver, a very dark red, red colour 
Uh, there's been no ear in there at all. The inference is the lamb has died prior to being born. Yeah. Do people still mother mother on? Because, you know, it's pretty easy care to just drive past and count the twins nowadays. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They do, I mean, yeah, they do. And um, even commercial farmers at the moment, I mean, that, uh, there's still many, 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 uh, many mothered on many mothered on lambs. They can cause a hell of a headache at the clinic, actually, when we, we're having all these... Um, Orphan lambs brought in, and it's quite a common thing around the village now to have the to have all the kids in the village wanting a pet lamb. So, <laughs> <laughs> and they, but you get to send to sell the milk yeah, powder yeah, for we, them as yeah, well, and though. all the little animal health problems that occur here. <laughs> Yeah, most of them die from steel poison just across there don't they? <laughs> later in life. Um, goiter, speaking of throats. Yep, so goiter, another very mm. common uh, cause of weak lambs, a lamb that may fail to thrive or die within the first few days of life. Uh, typically, um, primarily caused through an iodine problem, iodine deficiency, but most commonly that iodine deficiency is induced through uh, the feeding of brassica crops or root crops, um, in particular to the ewe during... Um, sort of mid to late pregnancy, okay. uh, these, these feedstuffs contain chemical compounds that bind up the iodine and make it less available. If there's a high risk of that earlier on during, during the, the, the season when, we're, when we've got pregnant ewes on the ground and feeding, feeding winter, winter crop, uh, then sometimes supplementation needs to be thought about. Um, we're sort of too far on from that now. But um, certainly looking at the thyroid gland just under the larynx, if there's a big enlarged sort of gland or a nobular organ in that area, uh, then certainly goiters on the cards and, and we do get very, very weak, sickly looking little lambs when, when that occurs and easily preventable as long as we know what's going on. So there's a lot that can go wrong. Absolutely, there's a lot that can go wrong. Luckily not a lot goes wrong uh, in general. But that's why it's important to do this recording, and even even uh, for re for retrospective work, um, working out plans for the coming season next year. If there's a problem this this season, um, getting a diagnosis, working with your veterinarian, and uh, understanding what's going on, so good measures can be put in place to prevent the same thing happening next year, is very very important. Nick, thank you very much indeed. In just a moment, we talk to Peter Hyde from MPI. Peter, North Canterbury still looking pretty tough. Yeah, very tough in North Canterbury at the moment. Uh, it's particularly dry. Uh, it's been a dry winter. And um, yeah, most of those farmers up there have been feeding out since January. Uh, then they've lost a fair bit of money. Uh, they've also had to destock a lot of their capital stocks. So they're doing it pretty hard up there at the moment. But they did get some rain. Yeah, they did get a bit of rain over the weekend. We, uh, I think I got about 20 mil, so that will certainly help the situation. Uh, but uh, last week the Minister announced that he was extending the drought uh, through to February and a bit more money was made available to the Rural Support Trust uh, so they can continue the excellent work that they've been doing in that North Canterbury area. The vets up there have been really, really great. Yes, um, yep, the vets, um, M Page and, and Noel from North Canterbury Vets, I mean they've been offering some free uh, farm visits, so they've been doing an excellent job uh, of just um, yeah monitoring farms and making sure that farmers are doing the right thing and um, and offering some advice. So uh, yeah, they've been doing an excellent job. Nationally, how we're we looking with uh, lambing and calving underway? Yep, we're st at the start of it now. So um, yeah, we will expect to get busy from now really in animal welfare. Uh, it's been a reasonably quiet winter for us so far. We think um, a lot of farmers did the right thing and they destocked heavily. Uh, but now things are starting to get tough. Um, with calving, there'll be the usual drop in condition. And, uh, you know, the farms or the, uh, that haven't got enough condition on their stock, now they're going to be up against it, really. So we expect to see a few more jobs coming in with um, light condition animals. What are you saying, sort of milk fever and that sort of thing? A little bit, um, more just lack of body condition after calving. Um, so far, but we haven't um, we haven't had too many major uh, jobs to deal with yet. I think too, it's important that people keep using their, their veterinarians. We're hearing stories that um, people, the odd farmer might be uh, not calling a vet in. Um, you know, you've still got to call your vet in to deal with issues on farm. It's not an expense thing. You just have to do it, don't you? 
You have to. You, I mean, you, you're legally obliged to. Uh, you can't do painful procedures such as dehorning yourself. You have to get a vet and to do things like that. If you've got particularly light stock that you want to transport, you need to get your veterinarian in to issue a, a vet certificate to, uh, so he can look after. He can look over them to see if you can transport them. So things like that, you can't scrimp on really. Look, going back to North Canterbury, are the stock able to be moved? I mean, how bad is the stock level over there? Uh, hearing different stories, I mean, a lot of people um, graze their sheep off off their farms. Um, some are bringing them back, but we certainly know some are making the decision just to leave them where they are, uh, rather than bring them back to the home farm. So it's sort of split the decisions that people are making, but some are certainly coming back. No, okay, the stock's basically all right, but what about the mental state of some of the farmers? Yeah, there's a lot of stress out there. Uh, people have lost a lot of money and it just carries on this, this dry spell. So, yeah, certainly farmers are stressed and we're very aware of that situation. Like I said, you know, the Rural Support Trust is doing an excellent job making farm visits around the place and just talking with people. Uh, lots of very good uh, field days uh, and social events that um, people have arranged for farmers. So, yeah, people are a bit fragile, but uh, there's lots of good people out there doing good work to uh, try and keep spirits up. And you have a new role? Yeah, I'm the um, National Manager of Animal Welfare, so that's a new role for me and that's uh, just getting some coordination with all our various animal welfare inspectors throughout New Zealand. Um, yeah, so it's my new role. Now, let's just reiterate that you guys are more education than policemen, aren't you? A bit of both. Uh, we would like to be involved at an early stage while there's still options. Um, often an animal welfare inspector will go to a job, uh, let's say for example light stock, and we will bring in a veterinarian and we will often bring in a farm consultant and it's really sitting down with the farmer to arrive at the best possible solution going forward. Usually by the time we've, we're involved doing nothing is not an op option, but uh, there are plenty of options how you might go forward and uh, we'll work with a consultant to come up with the best option um, for the farmer at the end of the day and, and for his bank balance at the end of the day as well. After the break I'm talking to Jim Grayson who's just come back from overseas. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We'll get you thinking, think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking, think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think water. It's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of we'll everything. Get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website ontheland.co.nz You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Jim 
some herbicides where you should be looking at those now with a bit of spring around? Well, actually, there's a bit of bud movement out there in, in the various horticultural crops. So what I really would like to say to growers today, Rob, is that uh, if we're going to put some of those residual herbicides on, now is the time to do it. Ground conditions, as, as I understand, are a little, a little dry. Mm. But uh, that'll, that'll still be okay. There's sufficient moisture then for, for them to work properly, adhere to the soil and stay there uh, and do their job through the spring and early summer. Um, but if you leave it too late, you'll start to get uptake of the plants and trees take, actually taking it up. So it's now to get it in while it's still quite daunt. Mm -hmm. But movement is very, very close. It's not that far away at all. So it's a really tight time factor. Yeah, it is. I'd say uh, we're mid-August now. So by the first week of September, you really... I oh, know, sorry, about the end of the first week of September, you should have these herbicides definitely on by then. Yeah, OK. Now, you've been out of town. <laughs> I've been out of town, Rob, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where did you go? Well, we went, went around the uh, Mediterranean and uh, some of the countries there and went, went inland uh, around um, Italy and uh, saw some vineyards, funny enough. And, uh, <laughs> well, it would have been out of character not <laughs> it to. It would have been out of character, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was good, actually. The, the country's look, looking pretty good over there. They've had a very hot summer, um, and uh, especially as you get further east in Europe, and uh, that has affected quite a number of the crops. Um, soft fruits and that are back. So strawberries, raspberries, those sort of things are back. Uh, and then as you go further west into Europe and go into the UK, uh, they've actually had a wonderful, uh, very similar summer to what we had last year in New Zealand. And therefore the fruit crops are behaving the same way. Um, slightly low in bricks, uh, slow coming in, but good quality. And uh, the growers have got good tonnage. So in general, across whether it be apples or, or uh, black currants or or even cereal, I was actually talking to a cereal grower, and so I happen to be in a hotel, but talking to a cereal <laughs> grower, and uh, they're, they're having some really good bumper crops this year. Unfortunately, the prices aren't that flash. And oh, that's, really? That's just, yeah, grain prices in the UK are, are down quite a bit. Uh, he was talking down uh, by 60 pounds, and I don't know what level he was really meaning they were at, but um, he said the tonnages were there, so they were, they were balancing off a little bit. I mm, mean, our mate Dennis Carter was saying a couple of weeks, or last week, yep. that if you did your whole farm in barley because of the compliance costs, you, know, you wouldn't make any money, you'd go broke. Wow. So, yeah, you know, I think we're sort of yeah. in the same sort of light. Really interesting. Um, but getting up to Scotland, uh, where they've got a lot of soft fruit being, being grown there, the strawberries especially, um, they're going very well. I was speaking to a couple of growers up there, and, and, and the reason being that the Eastern European fruit that would normally come into UK and, and into France, um, say Holland, um, isn't coming in because of the dry. So Britain's actually going the other way and, and sending some over, over the channel. And also, uh, obviously, their own market's strong. So they, they were actually enjoying some good prices on their strawberries uh, fresh uh, market. So, and they were in the, about the middle of the crop at that stage. They'll go right through to oh, just about into the second week of October with harvesting, but uh, they, were, they, were, they were very pleased the way that was going. So was What's handy. happening with Russia? Are there still serious embargoes? And oh, absolutely, and getting greater. I mean, Mr Putin's not changing, he's getting hardened, which is which is unbelievable, really. He, he, I mean, he is really quite happy to see his people starve if, if necessary to, to make the point that he wants to make. Um, and it has really impacted on a lot of fruit and vegetables in Europe still uh, of oversupply now because they're not rolling off into the um, the Far East and into Russia countries, Belarus and places like that. So, so that means, of course, quite obviously... Serious. It, yeah, I mean, that means the price comes down if there's a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I just happened to be speaking to a, a, a dairy farmer, and um, a Scottish dairy farmer, third-generation dairy farmer. In a pub, of course. Uh, no, well, actually, it wasn't, <laughs> actually. But, um, and he was saying, you know, he, the, the, their dairy industry is very similar to ours, and it's got some of the bigger growers have come in, and, and they're quite dominant, and, and all that sort of thing. He's got a he's got a five hundred you know, herd, uh, where there's, there's several <coughs> thousand. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, five hundred. Has yeah. he got names for them all? <laughs> yeah, it probably has. But I mean, that's a traditional family um, farming. But he said that the, the re, the, what's going on in the dairy industry, in his opinion, is that it's going to go on for quite a long time yet. Mm. So I, I hope that's not the case. I mean, all. All industries, when it comes to agriculture, have their cycles, have their times. And uh, I'm sure Brent was going to tell you about where the grape industry is. And, it was, uh, and may I say that um, uh, having a look at the prices of New Zealand wines in the British shops, that some of the ones I've been going to on, on an annual basis uh, just to, to serve, do the surveys, um, fortunately the New Zealand wine is now holding back into the position it was pre-2009. 
which is really, really good to see. So I hope that floats back to the growers back here in New Zealand because they need to be rewarded for quality wines mm -hmm. that they produce. It's interesting, Jim, that you're suggesting that this dairy thing isn't seriously isn't just New Zealand, it is worldwide. Oh, it's certainly global. I mean, uh, although I didn't go to Ireland, I spoke to an Irish colleague of mine who said the same thing. He said the dairy industry, and it's very similar. The dairy industry in Ireland is very similar to New Zealand in terms of size. And those guys, and, and in terms of where we're at of recent, say the last five to 10 years, growth in the dairy industry in, in Ireland. It's very similar to here, and uh, it's reliant, very much reliant on, and they are in, they are in trouble too. So it's a growth thing, it's just a case of that supply and demand again? Yeah, it is, supply and demand, and, and unfortunately the, the milk powder production has gone down a bit, so there's a lot of liquid milk sloshing around in Europe. I mean, it's just, it's just going for nothing. It's, just, it's, it's very, very cheap. So what's the, I mean, did you have a look at cheese prices over there? No, I didn't, to be honest, Rob, but um, I would imagine it would be reflected. In it has to be, doesn't it? Yeah. One of the things we did did come out while we were over there was the... the um, the, the, the uh, effect of sugars and, and fruits and, and juices and all those sort of things that are, that are made up of, from horticultural crops especially on, on obesity and there, were, there was no doubt and I, I can't speak myself but there was no doubt that um, having a look around the, uh, the, the world as, as I have done in the last five weeks um, the world has become more obese there's, there's no doubt and there's, there's this political football that's going on about sugar, sugar and, uh, and some of it should 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 happen, no, without any doubt about that, because unfortunately we see young children that are uh, terribly obese and still drinking Coca-Cola or whatever it may be, and that's 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 mum and dad's problem. It's not not the child's fault. No, and um, fever uh, the black current. Uh, um, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean the healthy drinks um, globally at the moment they're, they're down three percent um, in sales, and the trend is that they will continue to trend down where the energy drinks, the ones that are full of the caffeine and, and sugar, are going the other way. So the world's a bit topsy-turvy, isn't it? It is, Jim. It is. Thank you very much indeed. Straight after the break, we're going to be talking to Kerry Moore from the Rural Women New Zealand. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted southern oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. Kerry, one of the things you're worried about or concerned about as an organisation is water quality. Absolutely, and we're doing a little bit of work on that at the moment, particularly around the issue of E. coli infections and with our children and making sure that there's good, good quality water. You know, you hear a lot about um, people talking in the media about you know the problems of, of farmers and dirty water but the reality is that's the same water that we're feeding our families so we're not going to be looking out for dirty water you know and you know science and research tells us that some of the dirtiest rivers and water in the in the country are actually in the city rivers not the rural ones. Yeah, you wouldn't so, want to swim just by Walston there I don't think. No <laughs> no there's yeah there's some real real issues with with urban water and yet um, we hear more about rural water and and so we're really concerned in making sure that um, the water levels and nutrient levels are, are kept to a minimum and so we're encouraging people to get involved with Environment Canterbury's latest round of consultation workshops that are coming up in the next few weeks um, around I think there's sessions in Lincoln and Timaru and I'm 
think possibly Amberley, um, but where they're talking about <coughs> the water management strategy and about keeping the nutrient levels down and keeping water quality up because although it's um, um, water quality for irrigation fund, it's also the same water that's coming in our house wells into our homes and we're feeding to our children and bathing mm. it and cooking our food in and things. So really important to us that there's good water quality. And from a farming perspective, obviously you can't you can't get good results for your crops if you're feeding contaminated, you know, watering it with contaminated water and you can't make good milk with dirty water and you can't feed your sheep with dirty water. So water quality is actually a huge issue for rural people. And um, so we're paying a little bit of attention to that at the moment and encouraging people to be part of the debate and, and have their say. So when, when I was a, a lad on the farm, we had water race water mm. in one tank for for the hot water, and yeah. we had rainwater for the birds, and God yeah. knows what else. I know, I know. And I, I got through it all right. Well, you do survive. I mean, I suppose your system gets used to it if that's what you're used to, but it's it's not healthy in the long run. And well, probably didn't do us any good, really. I don't think so. No, <laughs> and and I, I know you know there's a lot lot of effort by um, local authorities to get rid of water races and and use other you know stock water systems. So. Um, and a lot of that's around water, simple water quality and supply of water, making sure that you know there's fair, equal allocations of mm. water. So um, we'd just encourage people to be part of the debate and, and to not have entrenched positions, but be open-minded and contribute. Um, do many people still use rainwater off the roof? Yeah, they do. Um, in the more remote areas, it does still happen, and it's always a good backup, um, cause particularly for rural folk, when the power goes out in an adverse event, for example, you also lose water. So it's great to have some kind of um, backup system but such as a rainwater tank. Now. More as a reserve, although there are still some who do rely on it a bit more than others. Yeah, I, I was particularly where irrigation you know, systems aren't in place yet. Being smallest in the family, it was me that went into the tank. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not, not nice, not nice. <laughs> you started so. <laughs> No, it's not. Anyway, moving yeah, on, moving, moving on. right along. So that, that's something that you're going to be looking at pretty we seriously. We are looking at pretty seriously, and, and our main concern, obviously, is making sure that our children are free from things like E. coli infections from yep. contaminated water. Yep. Now, you wanted to talk about the Domestic Violence Act. Yeah, that's uh, on, on the agenda again at the moment. Uh, Amy Adams has recently um, released a discussion paper around how um, domestic violence legislation could be reviewed. And uh, we've been doing some work on that for a long time, of course. Um, the issues in rural are slightly different. Um, we've got you know, fewer, less access to things such as safe houses and support services. Um, it's not so easy to get hold of someone if something is going wrong. Um, it's a bit isolated, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite easy if you want to, um, if you're of that mind, it's actually very easy to abuse people um, in rural sectors because of the lack of support. And it's hidden. It's very hidden um, and, and you, we can't make the mistake and think that it's all about men abusing women because you very much there's also the, the reverse of women abusing men. Um, there's adults versus children. Um, there's also um, an increasing incidence of um, people um, abusing elderly relatives. You know, elder oh, abuse is, really? is quite significant. And it's, it's in areas such as um, financial abuse, you know, spending the inheritance before you've got it, that kind of thing. Um, particularly people with power of attorney, you know, actually mm. taking advantage of an elderly mum who doesn't want to say no. Um, neglect, um, just popping them away in a restaurant and forgetting about them, those kinds of things. And so there is an incidence there. And, and just intimidatory stuff, you know, it does happen. And that's, that's a real shame. So we're, we're trying to do some work around those areas, um, looking at how we can better protect people in the rural sector. Um, and another issue there is, is uh, protection orders. Um, and uh, in a rural setting, it's a little bit different because if the perpetrator has to leave the property, you know, um, and they're the worker who the, the house is allocated to, what happens mm. to the family? You know, technically they're not entitled to the house, so there's some issues there. But also, um, they've got to come back to work every day. So they're still, you know, there's issues around having a protection order when the person still has to come onto the property to work. So we need to look at that area. And the other area that we're particularly concerned about is ensuring that protection orders in the future include animals. And why that is, is because there's a lot of evidence from SPCA and um, MPI Animal Welfare that animals are used as a, um, a way of intimidating the family. It's the threat to injuring the animal. You know, if you don't do what I want to do, the animal will suffer. Um, Really? Particularly at this time of year, um, in calving and lambing, you know, if you're going to leave, 
no one's going to be able to feed the calves and lambs and they'll all die, it's all your fault. Those kind of intimidatory things. And so there, there is an issue that there. mental cruelty. The mental cruelty. So we're looking at making sure that protection orders also protect the animals. And it's not just the family pet, it's also farm animals as well. How the hell do you enforce it? Very, very difficult and, and, and really relying on um, the police with protection orders to do that and also um, for people to watch out for animal welfare issues such as, you know, for example, cows with broken tails in the shed, those kinds of things, or unexplained injuries on animals, broken but, limbs, I mean, bruising yeah. that's unexplained and um, that perhaps should ring some warning signs. I mean, you can't rely on a neighbour to come and throw the person you've got the order against off the land either. No, you can't. It puts them in a very difficult position. So one of the issues for rural is about resourcing, you know, and police resourcing and support for um, such as women's refuge or other safe houses or just how you support people. And that's, that's actually going to be quite an issue. And we're going to be doing some work around that issue too. And I wish you well because that's a thorny old thing to be, to be looking at. It is, at. And, and to think that, you know, New Zealand has one of the highest rates of, of family violence in the, in the developing world. It's actually quite um, a shame on all of us, really, that uh, that happens. And, and I think, you know, we all know if things aren't quite right, but if, if we stand by and do nothing about it, then we're technically allowing it to happen, and we need to yeah. be standing up as a community against it and making sure we've got sufficient supports and resources in place to support people so they feel they can ask for help when they need to, and, and particularly men as well, because you know, men just won't stand up and say, look, hey, I'm being abused by my partner. Exactly. And, and they really need to because it's heavily underreported. Kerry, thank you very much indeed. After the break, we're going to be staying with the subject of law. Be Active begins here in the cold, clean, unpolluted Southern Oceans of New Zealand. Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. Natural, 100% pure. Manufactured from healthy deep sea fish from sustainable New Zealand fisheries. New Zealand's Be Active Amino Acid Biostimulant. The way the world is growing. Working with nature. Good for the plant. Good for the planet. Now that's growing for good. We'll get you thinking. Think water. I think it's all working well, Jack. <sighs> My thoughts exactly. We'll get you thinking. Think water. This is exactly what you need. I think that'll do the trick. We'll get you thinking, think it's all looking good. Did you bring the sauce? I can't think of we'll everything. Get you thinking, think water. For real ideas and real solutions, just think water. I've been reporting on farming matters on the radio and newspapers and on television for 40 or so years, but communication, like farming, has moved on. So we've come up with On The Land, online and through YouTube on any screen, anytime and anywhere. Just push play and see and hear what's happening today in our rural community. You'll learn and be informed about the latest and best information farming matters. On The Land, bringing farming information into the 21st century. So join us on our website, ontheland.co.nz. You know that saying, content is king? Well, in today's mixed media world, it's true. You need video, audio, photos and more for social media, for marketing, for communications, sales and for advertising. And you need this at a price that works with your budgets. Well, that's what we do. At Tandem, we partner with you to create the content that you can use to shout to the world or video link to a few. Connect with us and we'll help you connect to the world. John, I want to talk to you about contracts. There's a lot of people who are wanting to get out of them as far as dairying is concerned at the moment. Is it possible? It depends on the contract. Uh, there, there are ways if a, if a contract, contract's been breached to maybe... Um, cancel it or whatever, but it's not very easy. Um, it's obviously you need to get advice, look at the particular contract. Because I'd imagine there's a lot of farm owners who would be very comfortable if the share milker who's losing half a million dollars <laughs> quietly goes somewhere else, but they're not going to go anywhere else, but that's beside the point. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a contract if it's in writing and, you know, if it's been properly prepared, um, it will be enforceable, um, if you're looking to enforce it, and yes, it's not easy to get out of key thing is getting advice early on it. Yep. Um, it's sometimes fine with farmers, they might not have actually read the whole contract. So the first step, read the contract, get a copy to your lawyer, get advice on it. 
Because there must, and you as a lawyer would know, there's, there's got to be a lot of people who simply just let them roll through. Did the same thing for you she, the last year, Milka, so it'll yeah. be fine for this one. Yes, exactly right. And you know, sometimes a contract may not entirely cover the situation where it lets it evolve. Uh, and what I find is it's actually better to sit down and try and negotiate a way out of it. Uh, we can often talk to the other side and see if there's a way of maybe amending the terms and coming up with an agreement which will actually work a bit better. I mean, is there, um, I know that each individual case is an individual case, but negotiating, I mean, if, if you're going to lose half a million dollars, that's 250000 each, or a quarter of a million, Yeah, it would be a case of saying, well, let's, we're going to lose that money anyway, so let's do a cash settlement and bail each other out. Exactly, and, and generally we look at pragmatic uh, solutions there to try and make sure that you know, neither side will come out too badly and, it's, and there's a commercial incentive to actually um, I mean, the vary the contract to do that. Mm, because, I mean, look at the dairy cattle at the moment. They've halved the price, they're down to 1000 bucks, and there'll be less than that as more come onto the market. Yeah, I think um, all dairy grazing contracts, I've heard of situations where um, you know the dairy farmer's looking to, to maybe not honour the contract, um, and we would have a look at it and then just see what the, the consequence would be if, they, if that happened. Um, and there are quite strong legal remedies for breach of contract too, if the sums are big enough to warrant the, the expense of, of going to court. Because that's another thing, did they, did they end up in court? It's a very costly procedure to go to court and it's something we try and avoid uh, most of the time, unless as I say, the figures are, are big enough. And the, once again, it's each individual thing, but the courts obviously try to do the best for the person who's doing the suing. Yeah, obviously they have to look at it and you know consider just what the, the rights and wrongs in each situation are. Um, but to file and go to court sort of fifteen, twenty thousand dollars before you've you've really got past step one. So it's not a cheap process and it takes a lot of time. Yeah, and so the in the meantime the payouts aren't getting any better exactly. and the time's going on and yeah. on and on. One thing and also, the atmosphere's not great. No, it's not. <laughs> there are often dispute resolution provisions in contracts and that's probably one of the first things we'd have a look at and just follow that dispute resolution procedure which might avoid uh, the costly court proceedings. Share milkers don't have much of a, of a help because they're not getting that 50 cents advance which the landowners are or can do, the shareholders for Fonterra. So they're going into liquid, voluntary liquidation in some cases. Yeah, that uh, obviously depends on the assets that the, the usually a company will have and um, the liquidation process um, it might be worth looking at. Uh, if there's a lot of assets there it might not be but um, it is an option. Once again go to your lawyer and say, well, you know, I, I really need to get out because I can't afford to lose half a million? Yeah, we would hope that people actually contact us before the sort of the problem gets too big. Um, it's much easier if you're involved early in the process rather than sort of right at the end when things so have got to the You the want to be the, the, the fence at the top of the cliff, we do, don't you? We do, definitely. And yeah. people often see the lawyer as sort of a transactional person to be involved, but um, I think, you know, good lawyers, particularly you know, involved in the rural sector, can give pragmatic advice right at the start. Would you advocate having a solicitor with with an accountant and probably a bank manager? And definitely, the you know, so we always try and work with the accountant and the bank manager, um, not separately from them. Um, and it might be just a you know a phone call to to get the background and and make sure you know the full picture. It certainly helps. Yep, modern day, you can you can help anybody anywhere around New Zealand. Exactly, we've got clients all over the place. Um, you know, it can be Skype calls, email. It doesn't really matter. Isn't it amazing how we've come a long way because yeah, exactly. you know, yeah. you know, having to drive in to see the solicitor is yeah, gone. It has gone, um, and particularly as the rural broadband is expanding, it's getting better. Changing the subject to cropping, once again we've got a situation you mentioned about, about dairy support, but dry years and you can't produce enough barley for the contract that you've signed? That's a real problem because the supply agreements um, often have penalty clauses as well. Uh, so it is a real problem for, for a supplier who can't meet the obligations and, and often they have to, to see if they can source um, product from elsewhere to, to meet the needs of the contract. Because invariably those contracts are put out by the person who's buying the grain, not the exactly. person who's selling it. Yeah, exactly. So we've had, I've heard of situations where the sellers have had to actually buy grain off other suppliers to, to meet the their, their obligations. Yeah, and that's going to get expensive. It does. There's yeah. nothing more expensive than somebody else having what you need. Yeah. Again, <laughs> it's, um, this comes back, if you're going to sign a contract, you need to be aware of what's in it, get advice before you sign it. 
lawyers, go and see them. That's Definitely. your message, isn't it? Yes. Get advice early. It can save a lot in the end. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, because it is a very interesting situation, and each one of those is, is very, very individual. Yes, definitely. Right. Thank right. you. Okay. Ruth, what's happening in the world of conservation? Well, first of all, can I say how great it is to be back on your programme. I haven't seen you for ages, so I hope On The Land goes really well. Good information for the rural community particularly, but I'm sure for silly dwellers also. Um, so I have the conservation... Um, portfolio for Labour and one of the big current issues is that pretty well everyone who's interested in this has been waiting for a national policy statement on biodiversity from the government. It's a really important document that local authorities, community organisations can use to guide their activity. So this has been you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, hello it's 2015 we still haven't seen it and um, just over the last few days the Minister Nick Smith said he was prepared to progress the National Policy Statement on bi Biodiversity, but only if he gets a, um, an indication of collaboration from the farming community and from conservationists. So it was a big step forward, we might get the NPS finally, but it had a big bottom line, so to speak, this was the collaborative process. So I haven't heard any responses yet, but I think it's a really interesting development. Isn't it a case of trying to mix oil and water? Well, it, it is in a way. Um, if, you, if you said to most people, what do you think about collaborative processes, people working together to get an agreed outcome, it's motherhood and apple pie. Who wouldn't say they thought it was a good idea? But if you look a bit deeper, um, what we end up with is people agreeing to the lowest common denominator. They just basically go down to who couldn't disagree on this that'll be it. So you get a really low quality outcome and that's because the government isn't setting any standards or framework, they're just saying we want an NPS, go out and, and do it and we want you to agree on it. They need to have really clear principles, they need, need to have a really clear framework, what are we trying to achieve with this and then get people to work together to that end. At the moment it's pie in the sky. Do you think they're worried about TPP and, and the reaction from New Zealand is saying we want to know what's going on? Well actually I thought that the reaction from the government to the pretty big protests all around New Zealand over the weekend um, was really insulting. That I was at the rally in Christchurch, it was pouring with rain for most of it, everyone got wet. Uh, it was a very peaceful protest and it wasn't the renter crowd. Uh, it wasn't the people that you see at every protest um, on the TV. Uh, we had a lot of older people there who are worried about access to medicines particularly. A lot of people spoke to me about that. We had doctors there. Doctors aren't ones to go out on the street with a placard uh, protesting <coughs> against things. They are really concerned about the Pharmac regime. Uh, we had a lot of people who were just angry that, that New Zealand's sovereignty was being threatened, but we were having no say in it. So the secrecy was a big issue. And farmers were there, interestingly enough, saying, are we going to get anything out of this, or is this just another con? So you don't very often see farmers out protesting either, unless it's over climate change and <laughs> emissions trading scheme. Um, so a really diverse group of people. And Tim Grosser basically went, who cares? I don't think that's good enough when you have people voicing their strong concerns to just be dismissed. We want to know that our sovereignty will be protected, that farmers will get a better deal, well all of New Zealand actually will get a better deal, um, that our farm act regime will be protected, we won't be paying more for medicines, you know we've worked hard on that model um, across all parties in Parliament to protect it and now we, we risk losing it and it's being negotiated in secret. It's almost as though the majority of people have no idea what it's all about. Well, I think that when you have a, um, a vacuum of information, then it's often filled with things that may not be true. But in this case, we've had some pretty substantive leaks that are clearly accurate. Um, and that they do say that some of the countries that we're negotiating with are saying better access for New Zealand farmers over our dead body. So that, that's the point of a trade agreement. It's to give us better access to other markets. We haven't got enough New Zealanders to buy all our stuff. So we want the best possible trade deal we can get. If we are losing things in this trade deal and not gaining things, why would we sign up? 
doesn't make sense to me. And, and as you say, it's being done in secret, so we don't know. That there is nothing stopping the government saying, here's what's on the table, here's our bottom lines, here we, here's where we want to get. That at least would include New Zealand in the conversation. We, we did it in the past with the China trade agreement. There's no reason at all why this current government couldn't do it now. And Ruth, the other subject I want to talk to you about is Landcorp and, and expanding their dairying. It's sort of... It, it, doesn't seem to be appropriate time-wise. <laughs> uh, we, we've just watched Solid Energy pretty well collapse from having you know, multi-million dollar cash in the bank. We raise concerns about the pressure that the government was putting on what should be a protected industry. It's, it's coal. We know that the coal trade is going down, so we said keep their reserves intact. Solid Energy is now in huge trouble. Millions of taxpayer dollars, your dollars, have gone into that organisation and lots of jobs have been lost as a result. And now we're seeing Landcorp, when dairy prices are pretty well at the bottom of what you can break even on, saying we're going to expand into dairy. I'm not sure they've got their timing quite right <laughs> for, for, for taxpayers' <coughs> money again. So that's the first problem. Are we seriously putting taxpayers' money into dairy expansion? But the second thing is, what, what will that do, the increased competition, and it's quite substantial, what will that do to our existing dairy industry? This is nonsense. We've got dairy farmers who are on the edge of bankruptcy, who are in a critical condition financially and can't see much coming better for a while, and, and we've got the government backing expansion into their area. To a lot of people it would be very strange because most budgets for farmers are showing about a half a million dollars worth of debt, not profit this year. Well so. I, I, think, I think we've got a, a really big situation in dairying that the government seems to be walking away from. We've got banks that are saying you know, we'll support the dairy farmers f for a short term. This, this may not be short term. It's not short term. If, if they have borrowed big amounts of money and are relying on a high payout in order to service their mortgage and to build their business, and they're getting a low payout, they're in trouble, and it's not a short, it's not a short term problem. I think the government should be stepping in and saying this is a key part of our economy, as well as the individuals, what's it doing to them as people. You know, they're good people, they're just trying to make their way in the world. Um, they should be saying, we're going to be there to support you and make sure you come out the other side of it. Things will get better, there will be the other side of it, but it could be quite a while. Brent, you've just been overseas to the United States of America. Selling yeah. wine, how's it going over there? Ah, it's going very well. United States, New Zealand wines are really starting to become well known in the United States now and they're look, being looked at. Um, particularly people looking for Sauvignon Blanc, the stores, the company that we're with have 240 Sauvignon Blanc from throughout the world. Uh, they have 25 Marlborough Sauvignon Blancs, they have 35 New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs in total, and then they have a Chilean, Argentinian, Australian, French, um, anywhere that's in North American, uh, California, uh, anywhere that Sauvignon Blanc has grown, they'll have you know, quite a good range of them, so they have 240 of them. Uh, we're happy to say that um, our particular brand is their number one selling Sauvignon Blanc, which is, is always nice to have. Uh, so uh, we've worked on that brand for quite a while with them since we got <coughs> into the stores in 2008. But New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc is incredibly well uh, respected in the United States. And it's lovely to be there doing tastings, doing work, and just know how well New Zealand is known and, and, and appreciated by the Americans. Years gone by, people say, you know, you know, tell them, you know, tell an American you're from New Zealand and they'll just not know where it is. Well, that's not true anymore. They know very well where New Zealand is. And that's um, because of, your, of wine such as yours? No, I think we're spinning off very much from the success that Peter Jackson's films have had in North America. Um, really? Lord of the Rings, um, The Hobbit. Uh, to a lesser extent, the All Blacks brand, but they were certainly well received in Chicago um, last year, but certainly the the people will come to, well, you ask them as they're walking past you, know, would you like a tasting of New Zealand wines? And they stop dead and they say, oh, I love your accent. Uh, no, 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 we don't have an accent. You have an accent. Yeah, exactly. Of course, of course you they, just actually speak uh, English. Well, they, they crack up about the thought that they've got the accent and we haven't. Uh, and then they, they're immediately attracted to want to talk to you about New Zealand. And they know about New Zealand. A lot of them say, oh, the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings, whatever it may be. A lot have been to New Zealand. Lots of New Zealand's on their, on their bucket list to come here. 
Operation Deep Freeze had a lot to do with, with um, Americans coming to, to New Zealand. So it was widely respected, but then the quality of our product is also very, very widely respected as well. So there's a lot more room for more wine to go over there, do you think? Oh yeah, we're scratching the surface. Absolutely scratching the surface, really. It's a huge country. More and more people are drinking wine all the time. Uh, we're now seeing a real upsurge in uh, dining out as their economy improves quite dramatically. And that's having ramifications for the beef industry in New Zealand and, and, and all sorts of things will, will flow through from that. You mean prime beef or, or manufacturing? And manufacturing. Both. Huge. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Even though uh, the, the dairy cow numbers here are going to be killed in quite large numbers uh, and will compete directly against the, the bull market that you, normally New Zealand bull is, is goes to the United States for grinding meat uh, because it's lean, so is cow. Uh, there is an increasing demand for, for grinding meat in, in the United States because they're building up their herd and uh, at the time, the same time as people are eating out more. They're quite liking prime beef, which has been grass-fed rather than their feedlots? No. That was a very quick answer. <laughs> no, USDA prime is still still what is favoured, and you still go to, to the prime steakhouses, and they'll be, be advertising as USDA prime. No, the, the big thing for New Zealand, and the thing that really really confuses the US when you're talking to them and you get on to, to, to beef and to say, oh, yeah, so we, we supply uh, one of your leading uh, uh, hamburger chains with, with grinding meat. And they said, no, 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 you don't. Yes, we do. Uh, because simply the, the grinding meat of, of uh, cattle coming or feedlots is too high in fat, and they need the very, very lean meat from, from New Zealand bulls and all bulls full stop. Uh, to, to water the fatness down so that the hamburger patty stays together. So it's quite simple why well, there's, a, there's a niche demand in, in the US for grinding meat. No, prime beef from New Zealand is, was more Asia, is more Asia bound and um, that's where it'll go. The other reason that you went overseas, of course, was just to drop no, in No, the main Finland. reason we went. <laughs> the main reason we were away was to go to Finland and we just happened to do some work in America on the way over just to, uh, to justify the long trip. So no, we had to go to Finland to uh, see the uh, Rally of Finland. Um, it was uh, 30 years to the day that uh, John Kennard, Hayden Patton's co-driver, co-drove for me for the first, co-drive for the first time it was for me uh, in what was then the Rally of the Thousand Lakes in Finland. And so uh, it also happened to be the 50th uh, rally that um, JK had, World, World Championship rally that, that JK had done. So uh, Hyundai made a, a bit of a fuss over the, the 30 years and the, and the, and and the, the 50th anniversary. And the fact that they had this original driver there was, was uh, they made quite a bit of that too. So it was really quite cool. The, dro the result of the rally wasn't quite so cool, but the, being there was really good. He, he had a big one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and it wasn't, it wasn't because he was being silly. It wasn't as though he threw it away from the top of a brow. Uh, the, the rock was on the driving line and uh, it just, the, the wheel was slightly turned as he was turning for the corner and just a whole series of circumstances. Um, the wheel clipped the, uh, the rock, um, broke the steering arm and at 170 kilometres an hour, no steering, there's only one way you're going to go, and that was under the trees, so that's where they went. What's the reaction to him? Because I now see in the coverage on television that all of a sudden he's being interviewed, and all of a sudden he's being followed. Oh, he's, he's, he interviews incredibly well, uh, and he has the approach in the service park and with the team of a Kiwi and Kiwis are pretty relaxed. They've, they've usually got very good ideas on how to change things or how to make things happen and how to make things work. Um, and they don't, and, jo and, and Hayden in particular is not a prima donna. He, he's got no ears and grace. He doesn't think he's better than he is. Uh, and he doesn't even try and pretend that he's as good as he actually is. Um, so he is very, very, very well received, not only by, by the team and the team environment. You can just tell when you're there, the team environment were devastated when he, when he retired because he's the one really giving the results to Hyundai at the moment. And so uh, they were very, very sad to see him go. But it was really neat to be in the crowd and we were at the stage next from, from where he crashed. So we did not know he crashed until it came across the, the radios. And bearing in mind, they have a radio station devoted to nothing else but the rally all day, full hour <laughs> upon hour upon hour of screening of, of rally. Yeah. And all the stages are live and they're interviewing drivers at the end of every stage. And so a lot of it was in Finnish and we couldn't understand what was being said, but a ripple went round the crowd when on the radio they heard a stage further down the line that Hayden was out. And they have adopted him um, as, 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 a, as a Finn, uh, as simple as that. They, they see a lot of Finnish attributes in him um, and so uh, he's very much as a fan. He, the fans in Finland very much have adopted him as, as a, as a pseudo-Finn.
which is huge, Brent. That is cool. Thank you very much indeed. And don't forget, you can catch Brent's interview and all the others on the land by going to our website, www.ontheland. I'm Rob Cope Williams, and you've either been watching or you've just missed the program. But I will be back at the same time next week. Until then, bye now.